Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Graham, and I'm the pastor here at Brunsfield Evangelical Church. And it's my absolute joy to welcome you to our online service. I know we've got people from Peebles Evangelical Church joining us. It is great to have you. Uh, and I see from the chat on YouTube that we have folks from different parts of the world joining us as well. And it's great to have you with us as well. And maybe I could just give a special welcome uh, to you if this is your first time, as it were, here at Brunsfield. We're just so grateful that you've taken the time to join us. And it's our prayer as we set off into this service, uh, particularly what at the end of what has been a very difficult week for all of us, that on this Palm Sunday, that you would learn and experience something more of the greatness of Jesus Christ as you watch this service. That's why we gather as a church every single Sunday in person uh, to worship and to hear from the living uh, and the great God who we serve. So let me just give you a little bit of a heads up as to what you can expect during the next hour or so. At different points during the service, we'll play a few songs. Uh, we love to sing at Brunsfield. God invites his people to sing because it's a great way of focusing our minds and allowing the truth of who he is and what he's done for us in sending Jesus, his son, to be our savior and our king to resonate deep within our souls. So we'll be singing at different parts of the service. We'll also have a message uh, for the children from Peter, our youth pastor. We'll spend some time particularly in prayer for our nation uh, and our church. And then we'll hear a sermon from Christian Hofstra, who is a good friend of ours uh, and the pastor of Bellevue Chapel, uh, who meet in the north of Edinburgh. So that's what's in store uh, for us this morning. Uh, I'm going to now hand over to Gary Ferrier, who is one of our members here at Brunsfield, and he's going to lead us in singing the first song together. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us this morning. My name is Gary. I'm one of the worship leaders at the church, and we're going to be singing a couple of worship songs as part of our service today. So just feel free to engage with these however you feel comfortable to do that, uh, whether you want to just sit and reflect on the words or whether you want to stand wherever it is that you are in your living room or wherever and just really belt these songs out and um, that would be great if you're able to do that and um, just because in the midst of everything that's going on and um, we need to remember that our God is still God our God is still holy and our God is still absolutely worthy of our praise Psalm 96 says this sing to the Lord a new song sing to the Lord all the earth sing to the Lord praise his name proclaim his salvation day after day Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. So I realise that this is a bit of a weird setup that we've got for worship this morning, but... I would just encourage us wherever we are just to really embrace the situation that we find ourselves in and to really make the best of it because our God is still absolutely worthy of our praise. And what a shame it would be if this situation meant that God's people stopped singing to him. So if you're able this morning, please let's stand and let's worship our God together. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree We will 
shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face oh Good morning. My name is Peter. I'm the youth pastor at Brunsfield and I've really been missing the kids, missing seeing you guys on a Sunday morning. So glad I got to see some of you uh, on our Zoom call, our kids church Zoom call last Sunday afternoon at three o'clock. We'll be doing that again this afternoon, 3 p.m. Um, if you don't have the details for that, just get in touch with me and I'll let you know uh, how to do that. But this morning, uh, we're going to do a memory verse. Uh, and this memory verse is Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And this is a verse that was taught to us uh, by Graham a good number of years ago. I think it was at a holiday club. And we can remember it because he put it to a tune. So we're not going to say it this morning. We're going to sing it. So I need some volunteers. Have we got any volunteers here? Okay, here we go. Yes, up you come, up you come. Great, two volunteers ready to sing this. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. Hopefully, that will help you to remember Mark 10, verse 45, about how Jesus came to serve and to give his life. And that's something we'll be thinking about more as we head towards Easter. So it'd be great to see kids, see you again, 3 p.m. this afternoon. Bye for now. Well, thank you so much, Peter. And let me just say as well, a big thank you to Gary, to Ross, to Jamie and to Fraser, who were involved in creatively putting that music section together for us. Let me just take this opportunity to tell you about next week, which you may have forgotten in all the goings on is actually Easter week. And all of the following, which I'm about to say to you, will come uh, in the form of an email tomorrow. Uh, so don't worry if, if you miss something of what I've said. Uh, we'll be posting daily readings, a video and a song on our Facebook page. Uh, and the same will come via an email next week. And really, these are designed to help us devotionally prepare our hearts as we gear up for Easter weekend. And as you remember the death um, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So be on the lookout for them. I will also be praying on Zoom 
every evening next week as we've done so uh, since we've kind of entered lockdown period. Uh, I have just been so encouraged, uh, not only by the number of people who've been joining these calls, uh, but by hearing the prayers of God's people as we've prayed for our nation and as our church uh, during this time. So they'll be continuing beginning tonight at eight o'clock. Um, carrying on next week, please do join us if you can and just be blessed uh, and contribute to those prayer meetings. On Good Friday, we're going to make a sermon from our assistant pastor, Alistair Chalmers, available on this YouTube channel. Again, just as we maybe focus particularly on the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And then on Easter Sunday itself, we'll be having our usual 11 uh, o'clock service online. Uh, which is always a real highlight of the year as we gather together as God's people uh, and celebrate the fact that Jesus is risen and he rules and he reigns. So please do come 11 o'clock next Sunday, tune in for that. It would be great to have you with us. But we're going to continue on in our service now and spend some time in prayer. Uh, so let me just check if Ian and Bridget are able to join me uh, on this call just now. Ian and Bridget, are you there? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Brilliant, there you go, the wonders of technology. <clears throat> Are you guys doing okay? Yes, thank you. Great, well, it's wonderful to, to have you with us. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, and I'm just going to hand over to you guys now, and you're going to lead us in a time of prayer together. Let's pray together. Our Father God, we come to you this morning as the creator God of the universe, the one who holds all things in your hand, but at the same time, the one who is our loving Heavenly Father, and who cares for each of us in every aspect of our lives. We come to you with our guilts and our failures, knowing that you are a God of grace, that you forgive those who call on you and who trust in the Lord Jesus. We come too in our struggles and our trials, knowing that you are a God of love and that you care for us and that you can help us in all situations of our lives. And we come with our worries and our fears for the future, knowing that you are the God of peace and that you give us a peace in circumstances like this that passes all understanding as our trust is in the Lord Jesus. And so, Father, this morning we want to pray for our world, a world which in some ways has been united in the fight against the coronavirus and yet where there is so much fear. We thank you that you are in control of all things, that you know the future. And we pray particularly for those countries that are especially hard hit uh, at present. We pray for the countries of Italy and Spain, where so many people have been dying in, in recent weeks. We pray that the virus may indeed have peaked there uh, and that things will improve over the coming weeks. We pray for the nation of India, that, that vast nation where there is so much risk if the coronavirus is to spread. And we pray for wisdom for the government there um, in being able to control it. We pray for the United States as well, which now has more cases than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and again, pray that, that the situation may be brought uh, under control. We want to pray too, Father, for our mission partners, for those around the world who we have particularly close links with. And particularly today, we commit you, Ebrin Fiona Galito and the church in Paraná in Argentina. We were saddened to hear yesterday of the death of Claudia, who has been one of their partners in the gospel for many years, who with her husband, Miguel, has been a real witness in the state where their church is. And we pray for your comfort and your strength for them. We pray particularly that you'll be with Miguel and other family members at this really difficult time. We pray for our country as well. We thank you for the way we've seen over recent days many people coming together, whether those who are in caring professions and sacrificially giving of their time and risking their health for others, or, or those who have volunteered to help neighbours and friends in, in these circumstances. We thank you particularly that locally we have seen so many people who wanted to give towards the Basics Bank and, and to help those who are going through times of crisis without food and toiletries. We pray for the Queen uh, as this evening she gives the broadcast and we pray that, that may be something which brings the nation together uh, and that through it her faith uh, may shine through uh, and cause others to think about the Lord Jesus uh, and the trust that we can have in him. We pray for the Prime Minister, for the First Minister of Scotland, for the Leader of the Opposition, 
for the expert advisors and for all who will be making decisions that you will give them real wisdom uh, that they may be able to get the situation under control. We pray also for our city. We thank you for the city of Edinburgh and for the great Christian heritage that there is in it. But again, it's a city which is in shock, perhaps particularly with the cancellation of the festival for many people. And we do commit it to you. We thank you for the churches in the city. We thank you for the way that they have come together in many ways, uh, for the contacts and links that there are among them. We thank you particularly for our, our brothers and sisters at Bellevue Chapel. Uh, and we pray that you will bless them this morning. And we thank you for Christian. And we pray that as he speaks to us, that you will speak. And we will understand more of the love of the Lord Jesus uh, and what it cost him as he went to the cross to die there for us. We ask all these things and give our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all who have joined us this morning um, who don't usually do so. We do pray that um, they will be blessed by doing so. And on this Palm Sunday, we really do pray that we will all be able to shout Hosanna and, and rejoice in God our Saviour today. And amidst all the difficult things that are going on, we pray that we'll have the, the joy of our salvation and we'll be able to really um, just enjoy God's presence this morning. Um, but we do remember the difficult times and we pray um, for them. We remember that you've told us to come unto me, or you are you know, heavy laden and with burdens and that you'll give us rest. And we, we do pray that this morning. We pray for those in our church. We pray for all the medics, those working in social care, food production, all the key workers, all the carers, so many who are working so hard um, at this time and pray you'll be with them. Pray you'll give them strength and, um, and wisdom and clarity of thought and, uh, that, and that they will get rest as well and when needed. We pray for those elderly in our congregation and particularly at this moment we pray for those that don't have technology um, and that can't listen into this service. Um, we do pray that you'll bless them as they no doubt read their Bibles and pray um, on their own in their own homes. And we also pray for the vulnerable in our church. Um, those who have got to be particularly careful at the moment, help them to look after themselves and be close to them and protect them, we pray. We pray for Sheila, whose wrist is much better this week. Thank you for that. We pray for Fiona, who's hurt her arm. And just, you know, I pray that you'll help them with all the practicalities and just to remain trusted in you. Um, and pray for Lydia's as well, who's had difficulty with her wrist. Um, you just pray your blessing on all of these people. And again, we think this afternoon of the children as they listen into kids' church, help them with the technology. The, some of the young ones maybe not used to it. We pray that they'll have a good time seeing each other and learning about you. And um, bless them, we pray. And for the embassy that I'll meet after this service for their WhatsApp chat, we pray for very well. Um, and we just pray for John and the staff as they find new ways to work. Um, and, you know, there's difficult times when... Um, it's hard to reach out. We do pray that for the families and children in the north of Edinburgh that, you, that we work with, we pray that you'll protect them and be with them. Um, and for those of us this week, as we look ahead to the week um, to come, we pray for those who, of us who've got, we've got more time on our hands. We pray that we'll be proactive and make use, good use of the time to spend time with you and, and reaching out to others to help them, whether it's through phone calls or... FaceTime or whatever, help us, direct us in what we need to do, we pray. And for those of us that are extra busy, we pray that we'll get the rest we need, the help we need, and just um, we realise that we rely completely on you. And so in all this, Father, we thank you that you're a good God. Help us to remember that. Help us to remember that you are the Alpha and Omega. You are in total control. You're sovereign. Um, and in the difficult times, this week when we may be overwhelmed with the circumstances, we pray that we'll keep our eyes fixed on you and that you're always present in our time of trouble. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Have mercy, we pray, on our nation and our church. And thank you for your love that's been outpoured through Jesus. Amen. Our New Testament reading is taken from Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26 and commencing at verse 36. And Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. The Old Testament reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51, commencing at verse 17. Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained to its dregs the goblet that makes men stagger. Of all the sons she bore, there was none to guide her. Of all the sons she brought up, there was none to take her by the hand. These double calamities have come upon you. Who can comfort you? Ruin and destruction, famine and sword, who can console you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street, like antelope caught in a net. They are filled with the wrath of the Lord and the rebuke of your God. Therefore hear this, you afflicted one, made drunk, but not with wine. This is what your sovereign Lord says. Your God, who defends his people, see I have taken out of your hand the cup that made you stagger. From that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. Let's bring our prayers to the one and only true God who listens to us all. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we have together, for this time when we can bring our petitions to you, when we recognise that you are God of all the earth and all of heaven. You are our creator. We are made in your image. We thank you and we praise you for the words that are written in scripture for us. And as we've read about the time that you were in the garden, Heavenly Father, we just pray that we will be able to see that scene and understand what you did for us on the cross at Calvary. We just pray for Christian as he brings your message to us. Lord, help us to put it right into our hearts and may it change us, transform us into the image of yourself. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would take care of us all. Wherever we are, whatever home that we're in, whatever place we're in, Lord, I just pray that we will be able to bring ourselves to you and bring everything that is on our mind to you. Lord, you know our anxieties, you know our cares, you know our worries. And right into the middle of them all, you tell us not to be afraid. And we're not to be afraid because you have been here yourself. You know what it is to live as a human being and yet 
be God. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would be with us. We pray for our NHS, for the people on the front line who every day are working so that our hospitals are a fit place for the ill people to be. We pray for those people who are sick. We ask that you would heal them, that you would put your touch upon them. We pray for all those people who are working in the food stores, who are providing for us all the things that we really need. Help us, Lord, to just take what we need. And so, Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we have to bring ourselves to you and to be where you want us to be in order to listen. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Well, a very good morning, Brunsfield. Uh, it is wonderful to be part of your service this morning. I'm very sorry that uh, we're not able to meet physically together, but I hope you're keeping well, and not just physically, but spiritually, and that uh, God is really using this time to speak to you as a church, but also to you as individuals. So this time is going to be a time of transformation and a deepened devotion uh, to him and everything that happens. So we're going to be looking at this passage in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 and onwards. And if you have a Bible, I encourage you to have it open wherever you are, uh, because we'll be looking at that uh, together in a moment or two. But let me take you back first to 1945. On April uh, 9th, the German pastor Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who was associated with an attempt on taking Hitler's life, faced the gallows just outside of his prison cell in the Flossenburg concentration camp. Now, his famous last words are actually debated whether they are authentic or not, but they are quite impressive. He uh, possibly could have said, this is not the end for me as he faced his death, but it's the beginning of life. But even so, whether it was authentic or not, he certainly seemed, according to eyewitnesses, totally at peace and serene. And it's interesting that when you look up uh, the different uh, famous or lesser famous martyrs, that's often the description you find. Some even face their death with utter joy. So how different when we read about Jesus uh, agony and sorrow and his pleading with the Father, how different the picture seems to be as Jesus faces his own death. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, it's nearly what we would call Good Friday, but the week has been tough. Ever since the triumphal entry, uh, Jesus had opposition growing against him time and time again. He's also spent a lot of time with his disciples trying to uh, get as much teaching and training into them before it was time for him to die on the cross. And of course, the cross itself was looming larger and larger over that week. And events uh, described here in our text describe Thursday night. Jesus had had time with his disciples celebrating the Passover and actually giving it a completely new meaning some of which will have only been fulfilled by Jesus' death on the cross and maybe only would have made sense afterwards to the disciples. But afterwards, we now find ourselves in a garden, very appropriately called uh, Gethsemane, which meant the oil press, which may have been a hint to what lay ahead for Jesus as he would trod the wine press of the anger of his father. One certainly can't help but think of another garden, the very first garden, which was the garden where the rebellion all began. But here in the second garden, it would lead to restoration. Paradise restored, paradise made completely new. And Jesus came here to this garden to pray. And people this morning, I want us to see three things as we look at this passage together. First, I want us to see what leads Jesus to pray and see how actually Christ's agony reveals to us Christ's love for us. Secondly, we should also listen to what Jesus prays and very much see that Christ trusts the Father in his suffering. Thirdly, though, we must also see the lack of prayer of those who are with him 
and see how this passage also confronts us with how the disciples are found wanting. So let's first look at what led Jesus to pray. And I wonder if there's uh, ever been a time where you have faced something uh, very challenging, very scary, perhaps, maybe something very difficult. May have been an exam, maybe a driving test, your third or fourth attempt. But it might have been also an an operation, or, or maybe you've even faced death itself. Whatever it may have been, you know what it can be like and how it can really hit your stomach and it can give you sleepless nights. What we find in verse 37 and verse 38, the description that Jesus is uh, becoming more and more sorrowful and troubled. It says, he says to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. It's very much like how Psalm 42 puts it, how his soul seems to be downcast and disturbed within him. And it even leads him to pray to the Father, if it is at all possible, may this cup be taken from me. Now, let's not misunderstand Jesus. Uh, He's not having second thoughts. He's certainly not afraid of the abuse, the insults, or the lashes which are going to confront him. It's something much deeper. The Greek here literally means astonished or amazed. Now, you may think this is impossible for an all-knowing and an all-powerful God to be astonished or amazed at anything. But people, it's the, the realization, it's the first experience that Jesus has of the horror of what lay ahead. As one commentator puts it, all Jesus can see right now before him is the evil, the wrath, the abyss, the the chasm, the nothingness of the cup that he was about to drink, which meant exclusion from God, and with that, the exclusion of his love and his light. And people, let's remember that this is really only a foretaste, but Jesus staggers. See, people, the cup is a reference to God's wrath. For example, Isaiah chapter 51, verse 17 tells us, Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, and you've drained it to its drags, the goblet that makes man stagger. Now, this notion of God being angry and God's wrath is not something that many of us like. It might be exactly the aversion you have to Christianity. See, I told you that Christian God is always angry. But part of our problem uh, is seeing anger from a human perspective, and in that sense, from a human broken perspective, where we see anger the way we've experienced it ourselves as something uncontrolled, explosive, often disproportionate, and a violent reaction and very much the opposite of love. However, it is actually possible to be angry, not as opposite of love, but as part of love. Something I can get really angry about, almost in a helpless way, is abuse. You just have to open the the pages of the newspaper and you'll find abuse of all kinds, but particularly child abuse. And I guess it is motivated by love for me because as a father, as a parent myself, it's the last thing I would ever want to see happen to my very own children. And so similarly, God's love actually demands his anger at sin. For him to ignore it or not to do anything about it would be unloving indeed. And Jesus would drink God's anger, his judgment, all due to our filth, in our place. And to put it in other words, Jesus actually would experience the death that is due to sinners. And people, that's why on the one hand, we should by all means fear death, and yet at the same time, we don't have to. I remember growing up, somebody saying, do you know that where Jesus hung on the cross is really where you should have been hanging? But I want to take it one step further. Because not only should we have hung where Christ hung on the cross, we should have also been where Christ was in the garden, 
where we, we would have, like Jesus, been absolutely troubled by the sinfulness of man, especially our own. Yet because Jesus came out of his very own free will and placed himself into this agony that he experienced in this garden, our prayer can actually be different from Jesus' prayer. And so rather than praying to a father, God, um, if it is at all possible, may this cup that we deserve pass from us, we can actually pray to the father and say, thanks to your grace and your mercy, this cup has passed to Jesus and I no longer have to fear death. And so people, this is the love we want. This is actually the love that we need. It's a love that no one else can give us. It meant that the cup of judgment could become a, a cup of blessing, which we still rejoice and celebrate today. It also means that we have a high priest who not only fully understands anything that we go through, but also continues to pray for us today, bringing each one of us before our Heavenly Father. Can I encourage you that if you do not yet know this love, that you may today uh, commit your heart and your life to this Jesus and may you trust in him and know his love in what we see here today. For Jesus' agony reveals Jesus' love for us. Now, secondly, we also want to see that Christ trusts the Father in his suffering. Verse 39 doesn't just tell us Jesus praying to the Father, if it's possible, may this cup pass from me. But he also says, yet not as I will, but as you will. People may be very clear that Jesus does wrestle, and yet he obeys. <laughs> Sometimes we don't share that enough with one another, but it's okay to wrestle to wrestle with the things in life that we find difficult or find hard to understand. Isn't that what most of the Psalms are about? People wrestling with God. And yet the wrestling must always end with a submissive and a joyful obedience. Because this is exactly why Jesus prays, not just to, to wrestle, but also how he prays. Because Jesus, as we'll see, is when he prays, he calls God his Father. And it shows us so many things. Doesn't it show us that and remind us that Jesus knows exactly who he's talking to? And isn't it also a reflection of their relationship? And, and isn't Jesus knowing that God as Father is good and cares and is not only all-powerful, but also all-wise? And Jesus knows that he's loved. Hence, he dares to say in pure submission, not my will, but yours. That submission is even beautifully uh, uh, de demonstrated by Jesus actually falling face down before the Father. What a picture of humility and submission. And that submission again is seen in the movement in his prayer where once he prayed if this cup could pass, later on in verse 42 he, he says, but if it's not possible, I'm ready. People, Jesus trusts the Father in his suffering. I wonder how we react when we face um, any challenges or any fear or any suffering. I think a lot of us either try to run away, we try to avoid uh, discomfort at all means, we maybe even put our head in the sand, or we try to sort it out ourselves. We place the trust in us. And if we pray, we don't necessarily wrestle in prayer. We might just chuck it towards God, and even if we wrestle, we might only wrestle without the submission to follow. In that sense, I do wonder how much this virus and all the fear that many have experienced in the anxiety, has it changed us at all? I mean, how, how easy do we find it today to truly pray, not my will, but yours? But this people, this trust that Jesus had is the trust that we need. People, we ought to be praying far more than we do. 
And when we pray, we must know that we're coming to our Heavenly Father, who is good, who is generous, who, who longs to bless and works all things for the good of those who love Him. And people like Jesus, we must also come in that submissive humility, what I would consider true worship, falling face down. And in many ways, isn't this what the Lord's Prayer is all about? You may have heard this suggestion already, but the hand washing for 20 seconds can be accompanied by singing Happy Birthday twice. But it's also the time you can use much better by praying the Lord's Prayer. Because there we pray just like Jesus, our Father. And then we pray who art in heaven. And then we worship him and say, hallowed be your name. That is like coming to him face down to, before him. And then we say, your kingdom come. And then, exactly, your will be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. People, will we, like Jesus, trust the Father in our suffering? But thirdly, sadly, we do find a real contrast to Christ's prayerfulness in the disciples' prayerlessness. Verse 40 and verse 41 tells us that Jesus returns to the disciples and finds them sleeping. And he says, could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. I found it quite tempting to nearly overlook this or certainly underestimate its importance. I mean, we can make excuses, can't we, for the disciples? It's late, it's the middle of the night, it's been an intense week. I mean, wouldn't you have fallen asleep yourself? Of course, it's sad that they weren't more supportive, but if you're anything like me, I start yawning from about 9.30 onwards. I remember in my college days, somebody had organized an all-night prayer meeting. Boy, did I struggle through that Indeed. And yet, people, in the context, it's very clear that the disciples' sleepiness is understood, first of all, as disobedience. Disobedience to Christ's call to watch, and later to watch and pray. I even wonder if it's the initial form of denial that Jesus predicted, not only Peter, but also his disciples, to be guilty of later. Matthew particularly uh, mentions that it happened three times that they fell asleep. And so even though there's no crow, <laughs> remember, Peter had just said to Jesus, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But here's the beginning of him already starting to give in and give up and deny his very Savior, his Lord. But Jesus also points out that it's not just disobedience. It's not just some form of denial. It's actually that prayerlessness is utterly dangerous. He is calling to, to watch and pray so that they will not fall into temptation. Well, what temptation may this be? It's probably the temptation of unfaithfulness. The disciples are found wanting. And people, I do wonder how the church compares to them, how we compare. For we, like the disciples, have also been called to watch and pray. And it's interesting that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, and I wonder if Peter might have even thought back of that moment in Gethsemane. He writes, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your cares on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. People, how often do we find that combination of watching and praying, of being alert because of the devil, our enemy? Again, in Ephesians chapter 6, it reads, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Keep alert and always keep on praying. One commentator says, No prayer, no power. People, not only is prayer the, the secret to faithfulness and fruitfulness in our lives to God, but it's also the defense. People, insufficient prayer and a prayerless frame of mind, if we're not vigilant, we will be ensnared also uh, by uh, temptation and into temptation. 
people were told that Jesus, his, um, uh, Jesus Christ, his soul was heavy and the disciples' eyes were heavy. But people, even if our eyes are heavy, actually, exactly because our eyes are heavy, we must watch and pray. There is too much at stake. I guess part of the problem, uh, their problem as well as our problem, was just simple incomprehension of all that was going on, not fully realizing what Jesus was about to do. They hadn't fully grasped the love of Christ which was on display. Now, the tiredness wouldn't have helped, but all this incomprehension, even of what was at stake, would not have helped them in their lack in trust in the Good Father. So people may this scene and the agony that Jesus went through for us be a great reminder, not only of the great love that Christ had for us, that even though he had a picture of what he was still to go through and he went through with, with it and for it for us, may it also encourage and challenge each one of us to like him, put our trust fully in the Father, whatever we may be suffering today. And ultimately, may we always be watching and praying like Jesus. It's so encouraging to see that, that even when the disciples fail Jesus, Jesus doesn't fail the Father. How wonderful to see the depth, the height, the width, and the length of the love of God, even before we get to the cross. May it encourage you, may it challenge you, and change you forever. Let me pray with you just now. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you that it's relevant. Thank you that it can speak right into our situation in 2020. But thank you, Lord, that you've taken us back this morning to that moment in which Jesus Christ saw the death which really we as sinners are due. Thank you that you put your trust in the Father and said, not my will, but yours. And so you willingly took your place on the cross for each one of us. We thank you for that great love. And we ask you to help us now to put our trust in the Father also, just like you, and to be a church and to be a people who watch and pray so that we will not fall into that temptation of unfaithfulness. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, folks, that's the end of our service. Let me just say a big thank you to everyone who's been involved in putting the service together and to you for tuning in and for being with us this morning. If you have any questions about anything that you have seen or heard or sung, uh, then please do get in touch with us if you want to pray or to chat, uh, or if you want any practical help over the coming season, please do get in touch with us. All our details are on the website. Uh, it would really be our privilege and our pleasure to be able to help you in any way that we can. But let's close with these words from the Apostle Paul writing uh, to the believers in this church in Ephesus, and he's telling them what he's praying for them. And let's make this our prayer for one another as we leave today. Paul writes this, I pray that out of his, that is God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. Well, folks, thank you so much for watching and have a great week.
shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face